Sir David G. Manning became Ambassador of the United Kingdom to the United States on September 8, 2003. Ambassador Manning joined the British Foreign Service in 1972 and has held postings in Warsaw, New Delhi, Paris, Moscow, Tel Aviv, and Brussels. In 1994, Ambassador Manning also served as the British member of the ICTY contact group in Bosnia. And in 2000, he was the UK permanent representative to NATO and the foreign policy advisor to Prime Minister Tony Blair, the position he held until his current appointment in Washington, DC. Three years ago, he was made Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. Ambassador Manning read history at Oriel College in Oxford, after which he spent a year at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Bologna, Italy. His wife, Catherine, is a novelist. Following the lecture by Ambassador Manning, we will have a question-answer session directed by Corey Leonard, director, Assistant Director in the David M. Kennedy Center for International Studies. There's a microphone located on each uh, aisle on the sides down at the front that you could use for that question-and-answer session. We'll now be pleased to hear from His Excellency Sir David G. Manning addressing us. The title of his lecture is The Case for Multilateralism in the Post-9-11 World. Ambassador Manning. Well, can I begin by thanking you very much for that introduction and thanking all of you for coming. Uh, I do very particularly want to thank Dr. Rogers and the President's Council for their very kind hospitality to me since I've arrived. Uh, and can I just reassure you that I'm not going to be attempting the ballroom dancing bit, but I hope that I made you rather better on the foreign policy side. But thank you for inviting me because I know that Brigham Young is one of the great universities in this country and it's actually one that I have wanted to visit for a long time. Um, I'm very struck by the international reputation that you have, by the international focus that you give to your studies and it comes with remarkable international expertise as I was hearing when meeting members of the faculty earlier. And I know, too, that uh, Brigham Young visited Britain as a young man, so that does add a certain particular element to the pleasure of coming here. I want to say, too, that the UK does a great deal with Utah. We are the state's largest export market. We are the largest foreign investor in Utah. And therefore, I am really delighted that I do have with me, as you've heard, our honorary consul in Salt Lake City, Frank Jocklick, who looks after our interests so well. And I also have Bob Pierce, our immensely energetic consul general in Los Angeles, who's a pretty frequent visitor to Utah. Um, I think I'm right in saying was here most recently in January. He has admitted that on that occasion when he spoke, it was to the University of Utah. Um, so it's kind of you to let him in and he is the one in the body armor. Um, I'm going to speak relatively briefly because I want to leave plenty of time for questions, although I've been warned that, uh, by others who've spoken here that with an audience of this caliber, it can be a, a challenging experience, but I think that's what makes it fun and worthwhile. I'm coming to the end of my diplomatic career, which I began in a very humble capacity on Cold War issues. I served in Warsaw and Moscow, as you heard, and for a time was responsible for the Soviet desk in London when we were all eyeball to eyeball across the fault line that ran down the middle of my own continent, Europe. It all seemed very vivid and very dangerous at the time, a fault line that we worried could be a tripwire for a nuclear war. And I confess it now seems almost to have been another lifetime. Not infrequently, I find myself trying to explain what the Cold War was actually all about. I feel a bit like my father talking to me about the Second World War. 
The Cold War was a vital war to win. It was the result of common purpose and common resolve sustained over some four decades. It was a triumph of multilateral cooperation, working through multilateral institutions. NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is still the bedrock of Western security, provided the forum through which we cooperated together in the face of a common threat. And paradoxically, that threat forged an alliance and a transatlantic community that was far stronger than it would have been if we hadn't been in the business together of facing down the communist challenge. I was in Moscow in 1991 when the Soviet Union came to an end, miraculously without bloodshed. We hoped then, optimistically, and we now know naively, that this was the beginning of a brave new world. We took a peace dividend by reducing our defense spending. We hoped for a new and much more peaceful and cooperative era in international relations at the end of what had been one of the bloodiest centuries in history. And so it all seemed it might prove for a time. Until we had encountered the horrors unleashed by 9-11 and discovered that our brave new world was actually a very dangerous new world in which the post-Cold War security challenges were different but equally lethal and even more complex. Some of you probably know the story about the heavily bemedaled general frantically sticking little flags into a globe with a politician standing next to him and saying, no, no, that can't possibly be right. That means there must be more crises than there are countries. Count again. Well, it does sometimes feel like that in the post 9-11 world. It has become a very diffuse and difficult international situation. But what is clear is that we have emerged not into a world that is stable and predictable, but into one in which we have to grapple with terrorism and proliferation, one that often feels troublingly shadowy, without clear outlines, one in which national borders have lost their old significance. These problems of terrorism and proliferation infect or affect many of the most difficult issues on the foreign policy agenda. This is obviously true in that nexus of problems interconnected across the Middle East. Iraq, Iran, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, and Syria. I'm not going to say they're intractable because we have to find ways of resolving them, however difficult that is and however long it takes. But what is absolutely clear is that it is very unlikely that we shall find solutions unless we tackle them on a multilateral basis. This is true of Iraq. Internal reconciliation is a prerequisite for stability. But that reconciliation process is only going to be successful if it's part of a sustained effort by Iraq's neighbors and the wider international community to provide the necessary political context, the security support, the reconstruction assistance. This is a very tall order and I'm not going to indulge in Pollyanna-ish prognoses. But it is worth reflecting on how bloody the Balkan Wars of the 1990s were. A lethal mixture of sectarian and ethnic killings and atavistic score settlings, which I witnessed at first hand. And sustained multilateral effort, not least by that old Cold War organization, NATO, has transformed the situation and the prospects. So I take encouragement from the fact that there has just been a meeting in Baghdad between Iraq, its immediate neighbors, and its international partners. We can be sure that talking on its own isn't the solution, but we can be equally sure that without talking there will be no solution. So let's hope the process of dialogue both internally within Iraq and externally between Iraq, its neighbors, and its friends, is the first step out of the current morass. It's certainly been my view for many months that it makes no sense to ask our militaries to try to hold the ring in Iraq if there is a political vacuum inside it.
We can only make progress in Iraq if politics is a central element of the answer, just as it has been in the Balkans. And we're only going to make that progress on a multilateral basis. And the same is true in tackling one of the other and equally daunting crises in the Middle East, namely the Israel-Palestine problem. This is something I've found myself involved in now intermittently with for about 10 years. And it's deeply frustrating because with a bit of give or take, we all know what the answer has to be. This isn't one of those international crises where you can't see the way forward or what the end product ought to be. We know what the end product ought to be. A two-state solution with an internationally recognized Israel living within secure, guaranteed borders alongside a viable, internationally recognized and supported democratic Palestine. There have been times when we've been tantalizingly close to securing the deal, only to see our hopes dashed and the two promised lands disappearing again over the horizon. But we have to persevere. So I'm encouraged in this case that the US administration, in particular Secretary of State Rice, are now investing so much energy in trying to push things forward. And what is very striking is that they're doing this on the basis of a multilateral approach. Of course, the United States is vital. But the United States wants to work within the context of the quartet, which apart from Washington, in involves the European Union, Russia, and the UN, and wants to work too with many Arab countries, including Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf states. These examples of multilateralism can be multiplied. Iran is another example. Here's an issue on which Britain, France, and Germany have made common cause with the United States in fashioning a strategy to deal with an Iran that is in breach of its obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And we've maintained a striking unity in the past 18 months in trying to cope with this. And we've worked successfully, too, with Russia and China. Iran now finds itself under investigation by the International Atomic Energy Agency and sanctioned by the UN Security Council. And I think it's a fair bet that it never thought either of those things would happen. This does not guarantee that the Iranians will abandon a nuclear program in breach of their international obligations. I wish it did. But there's no doubt that the Iranians are feeling the international pressure, no doubt that they dislike their, their isolation in the face of multilateral cooperation. And like us, they must be aware that as the result of sustained pressure by a different multilateral grouping, the North Koreans recently, apparently, because you're never quite sure, but recently struck a deal to halt and reverse their nuclear program. And I should say, too, that since 9-11, there have periodically been anxieties in Britain and in Europe that the United States has lost its interest in NATO as a primary and multilateral means of defending its own national security interests. Anxieties that the US administration has viewed NATO not as an alliance in which it was a full partner, but as a means to leverage European contributions to promote US national goals. I've always believed that these fears were unfounded, and I think Afghanistan proves it. No issue touches more closely on US national security than Afghanistan. It may have seemed a faraway place of which we knew nothing before 9-11, but we now know very differently. It became a failed state, a safe haven for terrorists, a narco state, a danger to us all. Today, there are some 14,000 American troops under NATO command in Afghanistan. My own country has over 5,000 and is sending more. Our militaries are in the most difficult parts of Afghanistan, fighting alongside other NATO counterparts and Afghan counterparts to prevent the Taliban from trying to subvert and reverse what President Karzai and the international community have achieved in Afghanistan in the last five years. 
So let me emphasize, US forces are under NATO command. Last year, they served under a British general, David Richards. And so firm has US commitment proved to be to a multilateral NATO role that these days, the argument and the debate isn't about American attitudes, but rather now about European ones. Do the European allies have the political will to match US commitment to this multilateral undertaking? This is a very complex debate. We can touch on it if anybody's interested later, and I don't want to oversimplify it here. But next time you hear the accusation that the US is unilateralist, remember those NATO assigned US troops in, As in Afghanistan, as well as the other multilateral uh, examples I have sketched out here. And perhaps we should conclude that the charge of unilateralism needs more careful examination than it sometimes receives. This is not to say that multilateral approaches aren't frustrating, particularly for the world's only superpower. In the case of my own relatively small country, multilateralism is the guarantee of our security and prosperity. We want to live in a world that is governed by international organizations that set out and enforce codes of international conduct. So we're members of the United Nations, the European Union, NATO, the G8, the Commonwealth, the list goes on and on. And frequently as a result, we find ourselves having to make compromises, having to accept second best, sometimes having to accept we simply can't have what we want at all. But for us, the balance of advantage is very clearly in partnerships with others who also want a stable international system in which to manage Tom Friedman's flattened world. And it's bound to be different here. US power is vastly greater than that of any other country. And the US finds itself, whether it wants to be or not, as a central component to just about any international issue you care to name. There is much less, obviously, the need to tackle problems on a multilateral basis when there are such glaring discrepancies in capability between the US and its friends, not to mention its foes. Nevertheless, even a superpower has to deal with the realities of globalization and accept the realities that go with it of a new diplomacy. I began by mentioning proliferation and terrorism as two of the great post-Cold War scourges. No country can deal with those on its own. There is a greater need than ever to cooperate multilaterally through multilateral institutions as well as bilaterally in identifying and confounding these shadowy but potentially devastating threats. And we need to work together across international frontiers to track terrorists and proliferators who themselves operate freely across those same frontiers. And this is equally true of a whole range of other challenges that certainly played little if any part in diplomatic life when I started out more than 30 years ago. We now have the interlocking crises of energy security and climate change. And my Prime Minister Tony Blair has focused on these relentlessly for the whole of his premiership. They're difficult and contentious subjects. But one thing's certain, we can only deal with them on a global basis. If we're to manage the resources of the planet successfully, and if we're to master the huge challenges that climate change presents, we need to remind ourselves that we do share a single planet that's getting smaller all the time. And as the bumper sticker says, good planets are hard to find. And the same is true for health issues. No young diplomat starting out in the 1970s expected to be wrestling with the specter of pandemics. Now this is the stuff of diplomacy. This is what my embassy is busy doing a lot of the time. HIV AIDS, avian flu, and who knows what else that's escaped from the realms of horror movies to become deadly realities. HIV AIDS and avian flu know no boundaries. It only takes one sick passenger on one aeroplane to bring the problem to an airport near you, 
The confrontation between East and West, which preoccupied us for half a century after the Second World War, has thus given way to this diffuse, much more complex and difficult world. And we are only going to be able to deal with it if we work together, remembering that this was the winning formula throughout the Cold War. In making a plea for the multilateral cause, I also make a plea for continued US engagement. These are not easy times. Foreign and security policy is highly contentious and certain to remain so. And it's very easy to get discouraged. Some of you may know that wonderful New Yorker cartoon of a pack of wolves baying at a huge, cold, impervious moon with one wolf saying to the other, well, we're certainly making a noise, but are we making an impact? And foreign policy feels a lot like that a lot of the time. But one thing I am sure, whatever the dilemmas and discouragements and whatever the criticisms and the brickbats that are aimed at the United States, there can be no possibility of progress unless this country is at the heart of the action. The problems of the Middle East, the development of new energy technologies, new means of combating new strains of viruses, all this is very urgent. And none of it's going to happen unless the United States is playing a central part. And I do hope, seriously, that you will heed these words. Because in you, the United States has an extraordinarily rich and talented future. We in Britain and Europe must do our part. But we need you as partners, and whether we like it or not, most of the time we need you as leaders. The worst thing that could happen is that the United States lost its nerve or lost interest. The US role is an ungrateful one. It's very tough being top nation. But it does remain an essential one. And luckily, we have people like you in universities like this to take up the challenge and to secure the future. Thank you very much. As Vice President Rogers has indicated, His Excellency has agreed to take some time, the remaining time, for questions. Since this venue is much larger than the Kennedy Center, uh, we uh, ask that you please uh, form a queue at one of the two microphones on my left or right. Uh, there should be enough space that uh, those of you who have questions can line up. If you would also accommodate those who are in the middle and uh, need to make their way over to uh, line up, we'd be uh, very happy to have your questions now. If you would. Please state your name, your hometown, and your major if applicable, and uh, then state your question. Are there any questions? Very kind of you to mention the word Q, I must say. I think people are trying <laughs> very, very hard to deal with me in this. In this. Um, I'm Gary Ashcroft from Cochrane, Georgia. I'm an international relations major. Um, the apparent subservience of Tony Blair to George Bush has, been lo has long been noted by the American and British public, with liberal Democrat Charles Kennedy saying, Tony Blair is no more than George Bush's poodle. State Department senior analyst Kendall Myers enhanced this assertion by mentioning the one-sided influence exchange between these two leaders. Blair has particularly been criticized for not asserting himself and dissuading Bush from rushing into the disastrous war in Iraq, a war that has claimed lives of many Britons and Americans. With Blair set to step down this year and with his successor, Chancellor Brown, do you believe that Britain's leadership will begin to stand up to American brashness or will it continue to be a yes man to a presidential catastrophe? Well, let me go back to the beginning of what you said about the Prime Minister's relations with presidents. I think it, there is an issue here that is fundamental, because this is a very, very good question, and one I'm asked a lot. Um, Tony Blair worked extremely well with Bill Clinton, and he's worked extremely well with George Bush. And frequently, people find this very difficult to understand. Um, 
I think, on the whole, what politicians think they have to do is work with other politicians. I remember George Stephanopoulos putting a question very much like yours to Tony Blair when he was in Washington a year, a year or so ago. And his answer to that was, look, the American people elect their president, and the British people elect me to deal with him. <laughs> but it doesn't detract from the seriousness of what you say. And one of the issues that comes up constantly is this poodleism charge. And Tony Blair's political opponents make a lot of it in Britain. If you narrow this down initially to the Iraq point, which is, I think, at the heart of what you're talking about, um, first of all, I think you have to ask yourself whether any single leader anywhere else in the world could necessarily have prevented an American president from doing something if he was determined he was going to do it. I think the issue is, is there a dialogue about it? And is there a debate about how it's going to be done? Now, we came to the Iraq issue from a very different position from the current administration. Because, as I said to you, we join every club going in Britain, and we actually want the rules to work. And Tony Blair was very concerned indeed that after umpteen resolutions at the UN, and Iraq was clearly flouting them, uh, we were going to be faced with a very, very serious credibility crisis for the UN, a bit like the League of Nations in the 1930s. And so he very much wanted to get this issue resolved through the UN, and we tried very hard, and we failed. Um, but that was what he wanted to do. In the end, when we ran out of the UN option, he decided that he would stand with America in dealing with this crisis. And I think there are a large number of reasons for this. I think he doesn't believe Britain should be a fair-weather friend to America. And he also believes that the transatlantic link is crucial. And he was very worried, in terms of the long term, about what would happen if on the most serious security policy issue of the day, uh, we found Europe on one side and the United States on the other. Don't forget either, though, that at the time, leaders faced with Iraq believed, certainly they did in London, the intelligence that was in front of them. And the Iraq issue was a very, very difficult issue to grapple with. What we did know was that Saddam Hussein was in breach of his international obligations. What we did know was that he had used BM weapons of mass destruction on his own people. He, he used chemical weapons. And we knew that after the Gulf War, we had got the first Gulf War wrong, intelligence had failed. And we knew in the mid-90s that actually, despite the UN inspectors, Iraq had a very, very advanced biological weapons program. So at, the, at, the, at this point, leaders are faced with very difficult choices. Now, you can argue about whether they made the right choices, but I just want to put you back in the context of this so that you understand that it was much more complicated at the time than it has seemed very often with 2020 hindsight. The final point I'd make to you is that certainly as the British ambassador in this country, at least as much of my time is dealing with the differences between us, the tensions that run through this very remarkable partnership. But there are lots of things where we don't agree. And, you know, the the people who love to throw the poodle charge around find it rather difficult to explain why Tony Blair has led the charge on climate change, which is, I think, no secret to most of you in this room, not always entirely welcome uh, in all areas of, uh, of public life here. He has given a very strong lead on things like the International Criminal Court, which this country doesn't believe in. I could multiply my examples, the key example, I think, where we have found ourselves very often wanting the same result, but coming at it from a very different perspective, is Israel-Palestine, where there is a, a fundamental difference, I think, of perception. So I think, you know, the, the, the Blair-Bush relationship is important for all sorts of reasons. The Prime Minister believes very strongly there should be a very close relationship between the British Prime Minister and the, and the American President. 
But I think a lot of what you hear and see that's uh, kicked around is pretty superficial and often, very often, part of the British political um, give and take is a polite way of uh, describing our, uh, our political life, really. Come back over to this side. Please remember to state your name, your hometown, and your major. Yes, Jonathan Neville from Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm an international relations major and German studies major. Um, Mr. Ambassador, as an undergraduate, as an idealistic undergraduate, your case for multilateralism is apparent and I embrace it fullheartedly. However, can you explain perhaps why historically and indeed currently the United States is so often chooses a unilateral approach to solving problems? Well, let me say first of all that I shouldn't be standing up in front of you trying to interpret US foreign policy. <laughs> that isn't my job. Um, but I think it is my job to say what I was suggesting in my talk, which is that you have to look at each case on its merits, because a lot of the time, in fact, the United States doesn't actually act unilaterally. There are areas where this administration certainly does press ahead without friends or allies, and I, as I said, it's often the case if you're the only superpower that you are working with different set of perhaps priorities and constraints. But an awful lot of these big issues, actually, the United States is working very multilaterally. Afghanistan, as I pointed out to you, is a very good example, I think, and one in which the Europeans, we, we, we are very skeptical. But actually now, this is a huge multilateral effort. I think it's a, a much more varied picture than the caricature allows. I'm not saying there is no truth in the unilateralist charge. But what I am saying is it certainly doesn't explain great swathes of American foreign policy. My name is Jessica Smith. I'm from Indio, California, and I'm majoring in history teaching. My question for you is you spoke about the US as a top dog nation of the global uh, family, I guess you could call it. And I'm wondering what US as a nation and us as individuals can learn from the United Kingdom in our foreign relations and in our relations with other countries? Well, it's a very flattering question um, <laughs> and extremely dangerous to answer. <laughs> but, you know, what I would urge the United States to do uh, is to go on doing what it has been doing which is to lead the community of free nations in dealing with what are now global challenges. When I started out as a very junior diplomat, we could actually afford to ignore an awful lot of the world. We can't do that now. And we do have this transatlantic community of countries that share broadly the same value systems, belong to the same organizations. We are not identical. And we shouldn't kid ourselves. And the more we pretend we agree on everything, I think the more likely we are to have bust-ups. But what we need is the United States to play that part that it's been so successful in playing over the last more than half a century. Tony Blair has a very simple formula for foreign policy, which is he wants a strong Britain in a strong Europe that is a strong partner for the United States. What we need from the United States is that strong partnership. And I think it's absolutely certain that that transatlantic platform can't solve very, very many things on its own, but it is even more certain that almost nothing will be solved unless that platform is in place. And therefore, if we are going to grapple with that list, that shopping list I gave you of, of priorities we've got, we very much need America's energy, its creativity, uh, the sort of leadership that it has given it, the commitment to the values that have made this country what it's been. We need all that just as much this century as we needed it in the last century. So, you know, as I ended up saying, please don't go away. Uh, my name is Richard Wood from Winnipeg, Canada, um, and I'm studying political science. So, Mr. Ambassador, I just have a question about, well, mainly first that I... I definitely agree with you about multilateralism. That's the way to go as far as how we, how we handled confrontations all around the world and deal with them. But uh, there's part of me that also 
Well, I, I'm wondering how valid these arguments are. I often read on the radio or in blogs or in newspapers the argument of just how hard it is to, to rationalize or deal with countries that are led by such radical regimes as they, as they call them. And so I'm wondering, have you seen evidence in just in the recent years of, of successful diplom diplomatic efforts to deal with radicals that I guess popular media sees as radical? Well, the fundamental example is the one that I tried to set out, which is the collapse of communism. And that was a pretty unpleasant system. And the liberation of the whole of Central and Eastern Europe, quite apart from the collapse of a sort of evangelical Soviet ideology, was a tremendous success for the sort of approach that I'm advocating. Now, it's fair enough to say, great, that was then, this is now. Does it actually translate? I think there are real successes for multilateralism. If I cast it in a slightly different way, I don't think, unless we had used the European Union to reach out to the post-Warsaw Pact countries of Central and Eastern Europe, you would have seen anything like the levels of development, the stabilization, the burying of old hatchets that has taken place. So I do think that that is a very good example of uh, multilateralism, if you like, a very self-conscious policy on the part of my own government that believed that's exactly what the European Union should do. So I think that, uh, I do think there are some good examples. If you say to me, is there a recent example, I, in a, a typically sort of mealy-mouthed diplomatic way, hedged my bets on North Korea. But if it is true that the six countries involved in those negotiations have now reached the point where uh, North Korea is going to halt its program and dismantle it, that's a pretty useful result. Less multilateral, perhaps, but certainly bilateral. I, I remember from my time in my last job, we worked with you, well, with, I don't know, perhaps you're Canadian, but with the United States very, very intensively on Libya. And Libya has given up its pro nuclear program. So it is possible to, to, to generate success. Is it difficult? You bet. Can you guarantee success? Certainly not. But if you reject this approach, what is the alternative? That is what you have to answer. And however imperfect diplomacy is, and it often does seem terribly frustrating, like my baying wolves at the moon, nevertheless, I suggest that it's an awful lot better than the alternatives. It reminds me of, you know, the old cliche that now of Churchill, you know, democracy is a lousy system, but all the others are worse. I think that's true of multilateralism. Uh, my name is Mark Woodbury. I'm from Fort Collins, Colorado. I'm a political science major. I uh, was thinking about what you said about Iran and the sanctions that are currently posed on that country. And if the sanctions and other diplomatic solutions fail to stop them from uh, gaining nuclear weapons, what sort of options do, does the United States, Great Britain, and the rest of Europe have with dealing with Iran? What options do we have? You can surely sketch out yourself. We do nothing. We attack. We um, simply acquiesce. But I think this is really hypothetical because at the moment we aren't there. And I think it's very hard to tell you what the situation would be like if we reach the point where we want to give up on the negotiations. And I would argue that the situation is better in the last six months than it was before. That is, as I said, by no means, it is by no means certain that we're going to succeed in emulating what we've achieved with Libya and perhaps with North Korea. But I'm absolutely convinced in my own mind it's much the best option. And it is not clear to me that it is doomed to fail. It's very tough. But we now have a, a situation in which the Iranians find themselves under real pressure internationally, which they didn't expect to be, as I said, where the Iranian economy is in some trouble and where I think there are signs, perhaps, that some in the regime are rethinking the negotiation option. So I certainly don't want to get into what would happen if that failed. And I think if we start discussing this, it almost creates the climate where we will fail. And what I want us to do internationally is to sustain the international community, sustain the pressure, and see whether we can do with Iran what we have done with, with other countries. I think it's going to require a great deal of diplomatic creativity, by the way. I don't think a, a, re a result will be reached simply on the nuclear file alone. And again, it's no secret that my own country wants to see Iran engaged.
I mean, we, we don't buy the argument in Britain that Iran is somehow beyond the pale, so you can't talk to them. I mean, I'm, I'm very relieved. My job as a diplomat is to talk to people all the time, and if we, we didn't talk to people we didn't like, there wouldn't be very many diplomats. Um, <laughs> You know, I think we have to decide on how we deal with this strategic challenge. The Soviet Union was a huge strategic challenge, but it didn't stop us talking to them. So let's talk to Iran, in my view, about everything without compromising our basic positions, which is what won us the Cold War, actually. Uh, and I don't think we're anywhere near the stage where we should be giving up on this option and, and talking about, you know, should we bomb them, should we do this, should we do that? I, I don't think anybody is really contemplating that for the moment, nor do I think we should. Um, hello, my name is Philip Erickson. I'm from Orem, Utah, and studying international relations, um, specializing in Asian politics and history. Um, my question was about the House of Lords. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately of changing and voting, of changing the House of Lords to, um, to elected representation rather than hereditary. Um, what do you think the possibilities are of that passing and what effects would that have on the power and influence of the House of Lords and the British government? Yeah. Well, I can't be sure what the chances are of it finally becoming law are, but I think they must be good because the majority was very great for, for the change. And up to now, we have had this debate that has gone on for a very, very long time without reaching a conclusion. And to find that there is a large majority in favor of this one solution, I think tips the scales pretty decisively in favor of an elected second chamber. I mean, my, I now talk entirely privately because, you know, there isn't a government position on this. I'm personally pleased. I think it's an anomaly to have um, a, a chamber that has hereditary peers sitting in it. And I think it's also, you know, slightly bizarre to go around the world encouraging everybody to think about democracy when we have a House of Lords, which is manifestly, in some respects, not terribly clearly representative. Um, but I think it probably will go through. I think it does raise big issues for us because we, you know, we absolutely want a second chamber to be a review chamber. But once it's elected, it has a legitimacy that changes the balance with the House of Commons. And an awful lot of people in the House of Commons in the past have sort of secretly connived at this arrangement because they don't want a competitor. And so we don't know exactly how an elected second chamber will impact on the primacy of the House of Commons. And nor will we until we get one. But there's a lot to work out there. And it, it does, if, if it goes through, it will undoubtedly represent a major constitutional change in Britain. And in a very typically British way, you know, we'll muddle through. One last question, so please. My name's Monica Wood. I'm from Mesa, Arizona. I'm an English teaching major. Um, I'm aware that there's been a good deal of speculation recently in the British media concerning the possibility of Tony Blair's term ending shortly. I was wondering what you believe the implications on that would be for um, British support in Iraq. Well, I think you're absolutely right about the, the term ending shortly. I mean, all, all the Prime Minister said himself last autumn, last fall, that he would not be Prime Minister next time his party conference took place, which is September. And so my own assumption, and I have no privileged information, is that he will probably go in the summer before the vacation break happens, and when Parliament reassembles, the Labour Party will have elected a new leader, and that that leader will become the Prime Minister, because that's how our system works. You don't have to have an election when the Prime Minister changes, as you probably know. My own a guess, and again, it is a complete guess. I have no idea what a new Prime Minister will do. But I remind you that new Labour was the invention of two people, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. And if Gordon Brown succeeds him, and at the moment he's our Finance Minister, it will be a surprise to me anyway, personally, if there are dramatic shifts in fundamental policies. Of course, the style will be different. And of course, he will you know, want to go out and branch out in different ways. But the best answer I can give you is that I think if it is Gordon Brown, he has a very long track record as a transatlanticist. I mean, right down to his, you know, his private life, he's been holidaying in this country for a very, very long time every summer. 
and he has many American friends. And I don't anticipate great shifts in the, the, the sorts of policies that these two men, however up and down the relationship may have been from time to time, forged together for a, a Labour government that's now about to celebrate its 10th anniversary.